Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 311, Channing's The Evidences of Revealed Religion. In the previous episode of the Trinity's podcast, you heard William Ellery Channing bragging, and justifiably so, about the contributions of earlier Unitarian Christians to the cause of Christian apologetics, which is basically the task of defending the faith as rational, clearing away mental roadblocks people have to believing in Christ. In this episode, you're going to hear his own little contribution to that field, specifically on the topic of miracles. Our faith claims to be founded on miracles, and yet we all know that it's not rational to just believe any old miracle report. So, what makes these miracle reports special? Are we just being arbitrary in preferring these and not believing others? Or are there some facts about early Christian miracle reports in light of which it's reasonable to believe them? And thus, it's reasonable to believe that God, by His Spirit, confirmed, in a sense testified to, the Messiahship and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Jesus and the apostles claimed. But before we get to that, I need to tell you about something else. Folks, let me be honest. I know my own limitations, and I know the limitations of this podcast. I am a huge nerd. This podcast is basically for my fellow nerds, people who want a real deep dive into the meaning of biblical texts, to the history of Christian theologies, and into present-day Christian philosophy and systematic theologies. The podcast focuses on ideas, not people. It focuses on true and false claims and adequate and inadequate theories, not on people's fascinating life stories and journeys of faith. You can find in our back catalog more people-focused topics a few times, but let's be honest, it's very idea-heavy, and it's even, you know, difficult to listen to, which is why I put thinking music breaks into the episodes. It's to give your mind a little breather. There's another Unitarian Christian podcast that I assume you know about, the Restitutio podcast, hosted by the inimitable Pastor Sean Finnegan. And this one, I would say, is a lot more balanced. It has theoretical and practical topics. It can be idea or people-oriented. But today, I want to share with you some really exciting news about a new podcast which is kind of firmly on the people side. And this is the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, hosted by Mark Cain. In this podcast, you're going to meet different, fascinating Unitarian Christians. You're going to hear about their stories and their lives. You're going to find people to admire. You're going to find inspiration. You're going to hear about mistakes that you'll want to avoid, that they learned from. And instead of being hosted by a mega nerd like yours truly, it's hosted by the warm and friendly radio voice of Mark Kane, with what I would describe as a kind of friendly Midwestern American humor. For a teaser, here's just a little bit of an interview from his second episode, in which you meet the extraordinary mom, Hildy Chandler, and what it was like when her grown kid came home and informed her and her husband that he no longer believes in the Trinity or the deity of Christ. So one day, our son, he called and said, can I come over and hang out with you a while? And of course, what parent doesn't want their adult children to come home, right? So uh, we said, yeah, are are you bringing your family with you? And he said, "Um, no, I want to talk to you and dad. We thought, okay, well, that's a little odd, but sure, you know, come on over and we'll visit with you. So we sat down at the dining room table, and he brought a little binder or a little book of notes. In other words, he he came prepared to share with us what he had been learning. And he said, you know, Mom and Dad, I just, you know, want to tell you that lately I've been studying the scriptures when he was witnessing to them. Someone challenged him and said, well, who do you say that Jesus is? 
And, you know, of course, he answered that he's just God. But that thought really stuck in his mind. And he said later he went back and started studying. And he said, you know, mom and dad, the more I studied and the more I looked for proof that Jesus is God, the more I realized that it's not in Scripture. I need to tell you that I'm no longer a Trinitarian. I do not believe in the deity of Christ. That felt like, you know, an atom bomb had gone off, you know, in the dining room. He couldn't have said anything more shocking to his dad and I. We could not have imagined that that was why he was wanting to come over to visit with us. You're going to want to hear what happens next. This is no ordinary mom. And I think her reactions will encourage and inspire some of you. Before we move on to Channing, I want to give you another little teaser from Restitutio podcast number 368 called Introducing the UCA Podcast. In this episode, which you absolutely have to hear, Pastor Sean Finnegan interviews Mark Cain. And by the way, if you don't know what the UCA is, Mark Cain does a beautiful job briefly explaining what this organization is about. And in this little snippet, he's explaining his vision for the podcast. I intend the podcast to help connect people, and I intend it to point to great resources. That's kind of it in a nutshell. I will do more than just that, but at the root, that's what it is. I want Unitarians, especially the Unitarian Christians who are truly isolated, to get to know people. Like in the recent episodes with Hildy Chandler, I want them to, if one day they meet Hildy in person, they would know who she is. And they would feel a connection immediately because Hildy divulged some points in her life that give you a window into her soul, into her yes. experience. So the goal is to have a lot of people on the UCA podcast, a lot of discussions, a lot of personal human interest kind of interactions so that you get to know them and you feel more connected to the other Unitarian Christians. And you have great discoveries of how people dealt with being a Unitarian in this world. As I like to say in my show description, it's about living as a lowercase u Unitarian in a Trinitarian majority world. There are a lot of nuances to that experience, and people have felt it in many different ways. I want people to experience it through other people's eyes. I want them to appreciate what other people have gone through. There aren't that many Unitarian Christian churches in the world. I happen to be born into one, and I've lived my whole life this way. Many people who come to this understanding get there through very bumpy processes, and it yes. wasn't smooth. This is an experience for me to also enjoy and learn from how they got there and what happened and how they live, you know, what they do. I want to cover a lot more than just, hey, tell me how you became a Unitarian Christian. How did you, you know, that, that's interesting. But after 50 or 60 shows of people saying, you know, what their favorite verse was that turned their mind around, that's going to get old. I want to know about what they do. I want to hear the stories in their life. One day I'd like to have a chaplain on. How does it work being a Unitarian Christian as a chaplain where you're serving people of all people? You know, like in a hospital, you're just sitting down with somebody who may have no understanding of theology. You're looking for the broad scope, you're looking for the big umbrella, and mm -hmm. uh, you're looking to help people have a place to land. So again, that's called the Unitarian Christian Alliance Podcast. You can find it at podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org or the usual places where you find your podcasts. There are only three episodes posted. I'm dying to hear the fourth episode. And if you're hearing this some months from now, you're probably going to want to pause the episode right here, run over to subscribe to that podcast, and just binge listen them all. It's that good. Also, I have links to the things I've just mentioned on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Now, before we start, one little disclaimer about Channing's terminology when he says the word, quote, immortality, he basically just means the hope of life after death that is provided by the gospel. He's not talking about the old Greek doctrine of the essential immortality of the human soul. Without further ado then, William Ellery Channing's 1821 lecture entitled, The Evidences of Revealed Religion. John chapter 3 verse 2. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do unless God is with him. The evidences of revealed religion are the subject of this lecture, a vast and vastly important subject. Discussing it requires an immense variety of learning and all the powers of the intellect, history, mathematics, ancient learning, biblical interpretation, 
ethics and the philosophy of human nature have been summoned to the controversy and have brought important contributions to the Christian cause. To condense into one discourse what scholars and great men have written on this point would be impossible, even if it were desirable, and I have stated the extent of speculation into which our subject has led, not because I propose to give a summary of others' labors, but because I want you to understand that the topic is not an easy one, and because I would invite you to follow me in a discussion which will require concentrated and continued attention a subject more worthy of attention than the claims of that religion which was impressed on our childhood and which is acknowledged to be the only firm foundation of immortality cannot be presented, and our minds must lack the ordinary seriousness of human nature if it cannot hold our attention. That Christianity has been opposed is a fact implied in the establishment of this lecture. You know that it has had intellectually capable adversaries. I propose in this discourse to make some remarks on what seems to me the big objection to Christianity, as well as on the general truth on which the evidences of Christianity rest, and on some of its particular evidences. The big objection to Christianity, the only one which has much influence at the present day, meets us at the very threshold. We can't evade it even if we wanted to, for it is founded on a primary and essential attribute of this religion. The objection is more often felt than expressed, and amounts to this, that it's unreasonable to believe in miracles, and that the supernatural character of an alleged fact is proof enough of its falsehood. So strong is this propensity to doubt any alleged departures from the usual course of nature that there are sincere Christians who are inclined to rest their religion wholly on its internal evidence, and to overlook the outward extraordinary agency of God by which it was at first established. But the difficulty cannot in this way be evaded, for Christianity is not only confirmed by miracles, but is in itself, in its very essence, a miraculous religion. It is not a system which the human mind might have invented in the ordinary exercise of its powers in response to the ordinary course of nature. Its doctrines, especially those which relate to its founder, claim for it the distinction of being a supernatural provision for the recovery of the human race. Thus, the objection which I have stated still presses upon us, and if it is well grounded, it is fatal to Christianity. It is proper then to begin the discussion with asking where the human disposition to discredit miracles comes from and how far it is rational. A preliminary remark of some importance is that this disposition is not a necessary part or a built-in tendency of our mental constitution, like the disposition to trace effects back to adequate causes. We are indeed made so as to expect a continuance of that order of nature which we have uniformly experienced, but we are not made so as to revolt against alleged violations of that order and to consider them impossible or absurd. On the contrary, people everywhere show a strong and incurable propensity to believe in miracles. Almost all histories until within the last few centuries reported seriously supernatural facts. Skepticism as to miracles is comparatively a new thing, an exception being the Epicurean or atheistical sect among the ancients. And so far from being founded in human nature, this skepticism is resisted by an almost infinite preponderance of belief on the other side. From where, then, has this skepticism sprung? It may be explained by two principal causes. First, it is now an acknowledged fact among enlightened people that in past times and in our own, a strong human disposition has existed and still exists to admit miracles without examination. Human credulity is found to have devoured nothing more eagerly than reports of miracles. Now it is argued that we reveal here a built-in tendency of human nature, namely the love of supernatural and astonishing things, which sufficiently explains the belief in miracles wherever we find it and that it is, consequently, unnecessary and unphilosophical to seek for other causes, 
and especially to admit that most improbable one, the actual existence of miracles. This sweeping conclusion is an example of that hasty habit of generalizing, which is somewhat distinctive of our times, and shows that philosophical reasoning has made fewer advances than we are inclined to boast. It is true that there is a built-in tendency towards credulity as to miracles in a considerable part of society, a disposition to believe without due scrutiny. But this tendency, like every other in our nature, has its limits. It acts according to fixed laws and is not omnipotent. It cannot make the eyes see and the ears hear and the understanding embrace delusions under all imaginable circumstances. Rather, it requires the concurrence of various circumstances and of other tendencies of our nature in order to bring about belief. For example, Belief in ghostly appearances has been very common, but under what circumstances and in what state of mind does it typically occur? Do people see ghosts in broad day and amidst cheerful company? Or in solitary places, in graveyards, in twilights or mists, where outward objects are so undefined as easily to take a form from imagination? and in other circumstances favorable to terror and associated with the delusion in question. The human tendency towards credulity is as regular in its operations as any other tendency of the mind, and is so dependent on circumstances and so restrained and held in check by other parts of human nature that sometimes the most obstinate incredulity is found in that very class of people whose too eager belief on other occasions we look down on. It is well known, for example, that the effectiveness of the vaccine inoculation has been encountered with much more unyielding skepticism among the uneducated than among the educated, and in general it may be affirmed that the credulity of the ignorant operates under the control of their strongest feelings and experiences and that no part of society is slower to agree to truths which clearly undermine their old ways of thinking and their most settled prejudices. It is, then, very unphilosophical to assume this human tendency towards credulity as an explanation of all reports of miracles whatever. I grant that the fact that accounts of supernatural agency so generally prove false is a reason for looking upon them with special distrust. Alleged miracles ought, for this reason, to be weighed more than ordinary facts. But if we find that a belief in a series of supernatural works has occurred under circumstances very different from those under which false miracles have been received, under circumstances most unfavorable to the operation of this human tendency towards credulity, then this belief cannot be explained by the common causes which have blinded people when it comes to supernatural agency. We must look for other causes, and if none can be found but the actual existence of the miracles, then true philosophy binds us to believe them. To finish this topic, I observe that our propensity to believe in what is strange and miraculous, though evidence against particular miracles, is not evidence against miracles universally, but rather the reverse. For main mental tendencies of human nature generally have a foundation in truth, and one explanation of this propensity which is so common to humankind is obviously this, that in the earlier ages of the human race, miraculous interventions suited to our infant state were not uncommon, and, being the most striking facts of human history, they spread through all future times a belief in and an expectation of miracles. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Channing explains a second cause of modern skepticism about miracles.
I proceed now to the second cause of the skepticism in regard to supernatural agency, which has arisen especially among the more educated in recent times. These recent times are distinguished, as you well know, by successful researches into nature, and the discoveries of science have continually added strength to that great general truth that the phenomena of nature are regulated by general and permanent laws, or that the author of the universe exerts his power according to an established order. Nature, the more it is explored, is found to be uniform. We observe an unbroken succession of causes and effects. Many phenomena, once considered irregular and described to supernatural agency, are found to be connected with preceding circumstances as regularly as the most ordinary events. The comet, we learn, moves according to the same laws of attraction as the sun and planets. When a new phenomenon now occurs, no one thinks it miraculous, but believes that, when better understood, it may be explained by laws already known or as an example of a natural law not yet discovered. Now this increasing acquaintance with the uniformity of nature gives rise to a distrust of alleged violations of it, and a rational distrust too. For, while many causes of error in regards to alleged miracles may be found, there is but one adequate cause of real miracles, that is, the power of God and the regularity of nature forms a strong presumption against the miraculous exertion of this power, except in extraordinary circumstances and for extraordinary purposes for which the established laws of the creation are not adequate. But the observation of the uniformity of nature produces in multitudes of people not merely this rational distrust of alleged violations of it, but an inward suspicion that such violations are impossible. That attention to the powers of nature which is implied in scientific research tends to weaken the practical conviction of a higher power, and the laws of the creation, instead of being regarded as the ways of divine operation, gradually come to be considered as handcuffs on his agency, as too sacred to be suspended even by their author. This inward suspicion, essentially atheistical and at war with all sound philosophy, is the main foundation of that skepticism which prevails in regards to miraculous agency and deserves our close consideration. To someone whose belief in God is strong and based on experience, a miracle will appear as possible as any other effect, as the most common event in life. And the argument against miracles drawn from the uniformity of nature will weigh with him only as far as this uniformity is a pledge and proof of the Creator's disposition to accomplish his purposes by a fixed order or way of operation. Now, it is freely granted that the Creator's preference for or attachment to such an order may be inferred from the steadiness with which he sticks to it, and a strong presumption lies against any violation of it on unimportant occasions or for purposes to which the established laws of nature are adequate. But this is the most which the usual course of nature authorizes us to infer respecting its author. It constitutes no evidence against miracles universally in all imaginable cases, but may even give us evidence in their favor. We should never forget that God's adherence to the usual course of the universe is not necessary and mechanical, but intelligent and voluntary. He adheres to it not for its own sake or because it has a sacredness which compels him to respect it, but because it is most suited to accomplish his purposes. It is a means and not an end, and like all other means, it must give way when the end can best be promoted without it. It is the mark of a weak mind to make an idol of order and method to cling to established ways of acting when they impede rather than advance one's aims. If, then, the great purposes of the universe can best be accomplished by departing from its established laws, these laws will undoubtedly be suspended, and though broken in the letter, they will be observed in their spirit, for the goals for which they were first instituted will be advanced by their violation. Now the question arises, for what purposes were nature and its usual course appointed? 
I suggest that the highest of these is the betterment of intelligent beings. Mind, by which we mean both moral and intellectual powers, is God's primary goal. The great purpose for which a usual course of nature is fixed is plainly the formation of mind. In a creation without order, where events would follow without any regular succession, it is obvious that mind must be kept in perpetual infancy, for in such a universe there could be no reasoning from effects to causes, no induction to establish general truths, no adaptation of means to ends, that is, no science relating to God or matter or mind, no action, no virtue. The great purpose of God, then, I repeat it, in establishing the usual course of nature, is to form and advance the mind. And if a circumstance should occur in which the interests of the mind could best be advanced by departing from this course, or by miraculous agency, then the great purpose of the creation, the great goal of its laws and regularity, would demand such a departure. And miracles, instead of warring against nature, would agree with nature. Now, we Christians maintain that such a circumstance has existed. We affirm that when Jesus Christ came into the world, nature had failed to communicate instructions to us concerning matters in which we, as intelligent beings, had the deepest concern, and on which the full development of our highest abilities essentially depended. And we affirm that there was no prospect of relief from nature, so that an urgent need had occurred in which additional communications, supernatural lights, might reasonably be expected from the Father of Spirits. Let me state two truths out of many in which we needed intellectual aids not given by nature. I refer to the doctrine of one God and Father on which all piety rests and to the doctrine of immortality, which is the great wellspring of virtuous effort. Had I time to expound on the history of that period, I might show you under what heaps of rubbish and superstition these doctrines were buried. But then I would be repeating only what you are familiar with. The ancient classics which form your studies carry on their front the brand of polytheism and of corrupting error on subjects of the first and deepest concern. It's more important to observe that the very uniformity of nature had some tendency to obscure the doctrines which I have named, or at least to impair their practical power, so that a departure from this uniformity was needed to fasten them on our minds. That a fixed course of nature, though a proof of the one God to reflecting and developed understandings, still has a tendency to hide him from people in general, will appear if we consider first that as the human mind is constituted, what is regular and of constant occurrence barely excites it, and benefits flowing to it through fixed unchanging laws seem to come by a kind of necessity and are apt to be credited to natural causes alone. Accordingly, religious convictions and feelings even in the present advanced condition of society, are excited not so much by the ordinary course of God's providence as by sudden unexpected events which rouse and startle the mind and speak of a power higher than nature. There is another way in which a fixed course of nature seems unfavorable to accurate views about its author. It reveals to us in the Creator a concern for general good rather than an affection to individuals. The laws of nature, operating as they do with an inflexible steadiness, never varying to meet the cases and wants of individuals, and inflicting much private suffering in their stern administration for the general welfare, give the idea of a distant and reserved sovereign much more than of a tender parent. And yet, this view of God as a tender parent is the only sure defense against superstition and idolatry. Nature, then, we fear, would not have brought back the world to its creator. And as to the doctrine of immortality, the regularity of the natural world had little tendency to teach this, at least with clearness and energy. The natural world contains no provisions or arrangements for reviving the dead. The sun and the rain which cover the tomb with green plants send no reviving energies to the decaying body. 
The researches of science detect no secret processes for restoring the lost powers of life. If a human is to live again, it won't be through any known laws of nature, but rather by a power higher than nature. And how, then, can we be assured of this truth except by a manifestation of this power, that is, by miraculous agency confirming a future life? I have labored in these remarks to show that the uniformity of nature is no evidence against miraculous agency when employed in confirmation of such a religion as Christianity. Nature, on the contrary, gives us evidence in its favor. Nature clearly shows to us a power above itself, so that it proves miracles to be possible. Nature reveals purposes and attributes in its author with which Christianity remarkably agrees. Nature, too, has deficiencies which show that it was not intended by its author to be his whole method of instructing humankind, and in this way gives great confirmation to Christianity, which makes up for its shortcomings, fills in its chasms, explains its mysteries, enlightens its heart-oppressing cares and sorrows. When the Trinity's podcast returns... Channing briefly interacts with a famous argument for unyielding skepticism about miracle reports by the famous philosopher David Hume. Before finishing our general consideration of miracles, I ought to take some notice of David Hume's famous argument on this subject in his book chapter Of Miracles. Not that it merits the attention which it has received, but because it is attractive and yet fallacious, and has yet derived weight from the reputation of its author. The argument is briefly this, that belief is founded upon and regulated by experience. Now, we often experience testimony to be false, but never witness a departure from the usual course of nature. That people may deceive us when they testify to miracles is therefore more in agreement with experience than that nature should be irregular. And so, there is a balance of evidence against miracles, an evidence so strong as to outweigh even the strongest testimony. I don't have time to repeat the usual replies to this argument. Dr. George Campbell's book, A Dissertation on Miracles, which is accessible to all, will show you that it rests on an equivocal use of terms, and will give you many fine remarks on testimony and on the condition or qualities which give it validity. I will only add a few remarks which seem to me worthy of attention. First, Hume's argument affirms that the credibility of facts or statements is to be decided by their accordance with the established order of nature, and by this standard only. Now, if nature included all existences and all powers, this position might be admitted. But if there is a being higher than nature, the origin of all its powers and motions, and whose character falls under our notice and experience as truly as the creation, then there is an additional standard to which facts and statements are to be referred. And works which violate nature's regular course will still be credible if they agree with the known properties and attributes of its author, because for such works we can assign an adequate cause and sufficient reasons. And these are the qualities and conditions on which credibility depends. Second, this argument of Hume proves too much, and therefore proves nothing. It proves too much, for if I am to reject the strongest testimony to miracles, because testimony has often deceived me, whilst nature's regularity has never been found to fail, then I ought to reject a miracle, even if I should see it with my own eyes, and if all my senses should attest it, for all my senses have sometimes given false reports, whilst nature has never gone astray, 
and therefore, be the circumstances ever so decisive or inconsistent with deception, still I must not believe what I see and hear and touch. What my senses, exercised according to the most deliberate judgment, declare to be true. All this the argument requires, and it proves too much. For disbelief in the case supposed is out of our power and is instinctively pronounced absurd. And what is more, it would undermine that very regularity of nature on which the argument rests. For this regularity of nature is learned only by the exercise of my senses and judgment. And if these fail me in the most ordinary circumstances, then their testimony to nature is of little worth. Once more, this argument is built on an ignorance of the nature of testimony. Testimony, we are told, cannot prove a miracle. Now the truth is that testimony of itself and immediately proves no facts whatever, not even the most ordinary. Testimony can do nothing more than show us the state of another's mind in regard to a given fact. It can only show us that the testifier has a belief, a conviction that a certain phenomenon or event has occurred. Here, testimony stops, and the reality of the event is to be judged altogether from the nature and degree of this conviction and from the circumstances under which it exists. This other person's conviction is an effect which must have a cause and needs to be explained, and if no cause can be found except the real occurrence of the event, then this occurrence is admitted as true. Such is the extent of testimony. Now a person who affirms a miraculous phenomenon or event may give us just as decisive proofs by his character and conduct of the strength and depth of his conviction as if he were affirming an ordinary occurrence. Testimony, then, does just as much in the case of miracles as in the case of ordinary events. That is, it reveals to us the conviction of another's mind. Now, this conviction in the case of miracles requires a cause, an explanation, as much as in every other. And if the circumstances are such that it could not have sprung up and been established except by the reality of the alleged miracle, then that great and fundamental source of human belief, namely our conviction that every effect must have a cause, compels us to admit the miracle. It may be observed of Hume and of other philosophical opposers of our religion that they are much more inclined to argue against miracles in general than against the particular miracles on which Christianity rests. And the reason is obvious. Miracles, when considered in a general, abstract manner, that is, when divested of all circumstances and supposed to occur as disconnected events, to stand alone in history, to have no explanations or reasons in preceding events, and no influence on those which follow, are indeed open to great objection, as gratuitous and useless violations of nature's regularity. And it is accordingly against miracles, considered in this naked general form, that the arguments of unbelief are chiefly urged. But it is great dishonesty to categorize the miracles of Christianity in this way. They are palpably different. They do not stand alone in history, but are most intimately incorporated within it. They were demanded by the state of the world which preceded them, and they have left deep traces on all subsequent ages. In fact, the history of the whole civilized world since their alleged occurrence has been swayed and colored by them, and is wholly inexplicable without them. Now, such miracles are not to be met and disposed of by general reasonings which apply only to insulated, unimportant, and uninfluential alleged miracles. I have thus considered objections to miracles in general, and I'll finish this topic by observing that these objections will lose their weight just in proportion as we strengthen our conviction of God's power over nature and of his parental interest in his creatures. The strong aversion to belief in miraculous agency is founded in a lurking atheism which ascribes supremacy to nature, and which, whilst it professes to believe in God, questions his tender concern for the betterment of human beings. For someone who cherishes a sense of God, the great difficulty is not to explain miracles, but to explain their rare occurrence. One of the mysteries of the universe is this, that its author retires so continually behind the veil of his works. 
that the great and good Father does not manifest himself more distinctly to his creatures. There is something like coldness and standoffishness in instructing us only by fixed, inflexible laws of nature. The interaction of God with Adam and the patriarchs suits our best conceptions of the relation which he bears to the human race, and ought not to surprise us any more than the expression of a human parent's tenderness and concern towards his offspring. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Channing discusses the miracles that, in his view, support Christianity. After the remarks now made to remove the objection to revelation in general, I proceed to consider the evidences of the Christian religion in particular, and these are so numerous that should I attempt to compress them into the short space which now remains, I could give only a book jacket summary, a dry and uninteresting index, it will be more useful to state to you with some detail the general truth into which all Christian evidences may be transformed and on which the whole religion rests, and then to illustrate it using a few striking instances. All the evidences of Christianity may be traced to this great truth that every effect must have an adequate cause. We claim for our religion a divine source, because no adequate cause for it can be found in the powers or passions of human nature, or in the circumstances under which it appeared, because it can only be accounted for by the intervention of that being to whom its first preachers universally ascribed it, and with whose nature it perfectly agrees. Christianity, by which we mean not merely the doctrines of the religion, but everything relating to it, its rise, its progress, the character of its author, the conduct of its propagators, Christianity, in this broad sense, can only be accounted for in two ways. It either sprung from the causes within human nature, under the excitements, motives, and impulses of the age in which it was first preached, or it had its origin in a higher and supernatural agency. To which of these causes the religion should be referred is not a question beyond our reach, for being partakers of human nature and knowing more of it than of any other part of creation, we can judge with sufficient accuracy about the operation of its built-in tendencies and the effects to which they are competent. It is indeed true that human powers are not exactly defined, nor can we state precisely the bounds beyond which they cannot pass, but still the disproportion between human nature and an effect ascribed to it may be so vast and palpable as to convince us at once that the effect is inexplicable by human power. I don't know exactly what advances may be made by the intellect of an unassisted, primitive human, but that a tribesman in the woods could not compose the Principia Mathematica of Sir Isaac Newton is about as obvious as that he could not create the world. I don't know the point at which bodily strength must stop, but that a man cannot carry the Atlas or Andes mountain ranges on his shoulders is a safe assumption. The question, therefore, whether the built-in tendencies of human nature, under the circumstances in which it was placed at Christ's birth, will explain his religion, is one we can answer, and is the big question on which the whole controversy turns. Now, we maintain that a great variety of facts belonging to this religion, such as the character of its founder, its unique teachings, the style and character of its written records, its progress, the conduct, circumstances, and suffering of its first propagators, the reception of it from the beginning on the ground of miraculous testimonies, the prophecies which it fulfilled and which it contains, its influence on society and other circumstances connected with it are utterly unexplainable by human powers and tendencies, but fit together with and are fully explained by the power and perfections of God. 
These many details I cannot attempt to unfold. One or two may be illustrated to show you how to apply the principles which I have laid down. I will take first the character of Jesus Christ. How is this to be explained by the tendencies of human nature? We are immediately struck with this uniqueness in the author of Christianity, that whilst all others are formed in a measure by the spirit of their era, we can discover in Jesus no impression of the period in which he lived. We know with considerable accuracy the state of society, the ways of thinking, the hopes and expectations of the country in which Jesus was born and grew up, and he is as free from them and as exalted above them as if he had lived in another world, or with every sense insulated against the objects around him. His character has in it nothing local or temporary. It can be explained by nothing around him. His history shows him to us a solitary being, living for purposes which only he understood, and enjoying not so much as the sympathy of a single mind. His apostles, his chosen companions, brought to him the influences of their era, and nothing shows their strength more strikingly than the slowness with which they yielded in these honest men to the instructions of Jesus. Jesus came to a nation expecting a Messiah, and he claimed this title. But instead of conforming to widespread opinions about the Messiah, he resisted them wholly and without reserve. To a people anticipating a triumphant leader under whom vengeance as well as ambition were to be fully satisfied by the humiliation of their oppressors, he came as a spiritual leader, teaching humility and peace. This undisguised hostility to the dearest hopes and prejudices of his nation, this disdain of the usual concessions by which ambition and deception pacify adherence, this deliberate risk of rejection and hatred cannot easily be explained by the common tendencies of human nature and excludes the possibility of selfish aims in the author of Christianity. One striking peculiarity in Jesus is the wide extent, the vastness of his views. Whilst all around him looked for a Messiah to liberate God's ancient people from the Romans, whilst to every other Jew, Judea was the exclusive object of pride and hope, Jesus came, declaring himself to be the deliverer and light of the world. And in his whole teaching and life, you see a consciousness which never leaves him of a relation to the whole human race. This idea of blessing humankind, of spreading a universal religion, was the most magnificent which had ever entered the human mind. All previous religions had been given to particular nations. No conqueror, legislator, philosopher in the extravagance of ambition had ever dreamed of subjecting all nations to a common faith. This conception of a universal religion, intended alike for Jew and Gentile, for all nations and regions, is wholly inexplicable by the circumstances of Jesus. He was a Jew, and the first and deepest and most constant impression on a Jew's mind was that of the superiority conferred on his people and himself by the national religion introduced by Moses. The wall between the Jew and the Gentile seemed to reach heaven. The abolition of the singularity of Moses, the flattening of the temple on Mount Zion, the construction of a new religion in which all people would meet as siblings, and which would be the common and equal property of Jew and Gentile, these were of all ideas the least likely to spring up in Judea, and the least likely to originate from fanaticism or fraud. Compare next these views of Christ with his station in life. He was of humble birth and education, with nothing in his lot, with no extensive means, no rank or wealth or patronage to infuse vast thoughts and extravagant plans in his mind. The shop of a carpenter and the village of Nazareth were not spots for ripening a scheme more aspiring and extensive than had ever been formed. It is a general truth about human nature that, except in case of insanity, some proportion is observed between the power of an individual and his plans and hopes. The purpose to which Jesus devoted himself was as ill-suited to his condition as an attempt to change the seasons or to make the sun rise in the west. 
that a young man in obscure life belonging to an oppressed nation should seriously think of undermining the time-honored and deep-rooted religions of the world is a strange fact. But we see the mind of Jesus thoroughly imbued with this purpose. And sublime as it is, he never falls below it in his language or conduct, but speaks and acts with a consciousness of superiority, with a dignity and authority befitting this unparalleled destination. Relatedly, I must add another striking circumstance in Jesus, and that is the calm confidence with which he always looked forward to the accomplishment of his aims. He fully knew the strength of the passions and powers which were arrayed against him, and was perfectly aware that his life was to be shortened by violence. Yet not a word escapes him implying a doubt in the ultimate triumphs of his religion. One of the beauties of the Gospels and one of the proofs of their genuineness is found in our Savior's indirect and obscure allusions to his approaching sufferings and to the glory which was to follow. Illusions showing us the workings of a mind thoroughly conscious of being appointed to accomplish infinite good through great calamity. This entire and patient relinquishment of immediate success, this ever-present persuasion that he was to perish before his religion would advance, and this calm, unshaken anticipation of distant and unbounded triumphs, are remarkable traits, throwing a tender and solemn grandeur over our Lord, and wholly inexplicable by normal human tendencies, or by the circumstances in which he was placed. What we've said so far about Christ relates to his public persona and function. If we move on to what may be called his private character, we shall receive the same impression of inexplicable excellence. The most striking trait in Jesus was undoubtedly benevolence, and although this virtue had existed before, yet it had not been manifested in the same form and extent. Christ's benevolence was distinguished first by its expansiveness. In his time, an unconfined philanthropy, proposing and toiling to do good without distinction of country or rank, was unknown. Love to humans as such, love including the hated Samaritan and the despised tax collector, was a feature which separated Jesus from the best people of his nation and of the world. Another characteristic of the benevolence of Jesus was its gentleness and tenderness, forming a strong contrast with the hardness and ferocity of the spirit and manners which then prevailed and with that sternness and inflexibility which the purest philosophy of Greece and Rome taught as the perfection of virtue. But its most distinguishing trait was its superiority to injury. Revenge was one of the recognized rights of the age in which he lived, and though a few wise men who had seen its inconsistency with human dignity had condemned it, Yet none had taught the duty of regarding one's worst enemies with that kindness which God manifests to sinful men and women, and of returning curses with blessings and prayers. This form of benevolence, the most disinterested and divine form, was, as you well know, manifested by Jesus Christ in infinite strength amidst injuries and humiliations which cannot be surpassed. Now this unique height of goodness, this superiority to the degrading influences of the age under which all others suffered, needs to be explained. And by the way, it proves that Jesus was not an unprincipled deceiver, endangering not only his own life but the lives of trusting friends in an almost reckless undertaking. I can't discuss the other traits of the character of Christ. I will only observe that it had one distinction which more than anything forms a perfect character. It was made up of contrasts. In other words, it was a union of excellences which are not easily reconciled, which seem at first sight incongruous, but which when blended and duly proportioned constitute moral harmony and attract with equal power love and veneration. For example, we discover in Jesus Christ an unparalleled dignity of character, a consciousness of greatness, never shown or approached by any other individual in history. And yet, this was blended with a willingness to stoop to our level in lowliness and unostentatious simplicity, which had never before been thought consistent with greatness. 
Similarly, he united an utter superiority to the world, to its pleasures and ordinary interests, with an elegance of manners and freedom from rigidity. He joined together strong feeling with self-possession, an indignant sensitivity to sin with compassion to the sinner an intense devotion to his work with calmness under opposition and misfortune, a universal love of humankind with a susceptibility to private friendships, the authority fitting the Savior of the world with the tenderness and gratitude of a son. Such was the author of our religion. And is his character to be explained by fakery or insane fanaticism? Doesn't it bear the unambiguous indications of a heavenly origin? When the Trinity's podcast returns, what if someone tries to argue that this Jesus is purely a fictional character? Perhaps it may be said that this character never existed. If so, the invention of it must be explained, and the reception which this fiction met with. And these, perhaps, are as difficult to explain using wholly natural causes as this character's real existence. Christ's history bears all the marks of reality. A more frank, simple, unlabored, unostentatious narrative was never penned. Besides, His character, if invented, must have been an invention of unique difficulty because no models existed on which to base it. He stands alone in the records of time. The conception of a being proposing such new and exalted goals and governed by higher principles than the progress of society had developed implies outstanding intellectual power. That several individuals should join in equally vivid conceptions of this character and should not merely describe in general terms the fictitious being to whom it was attributed, but should introduce him into real life, should place him in a great variety of circumstances in connection with various levels of society, with friends and foe, and should in all preserve his identity, show the same great and unique mind always acting in harmony with itself, This is a supposition hardly believable, and when the circumstances of the writers of the New Testament are considered, seems to be as unexplainable using only general human tendencies as what I before suggested, the composition of Newton's Principia Mathematica by a tribesman. The character of Christ, though delineated in an age of great moral darkness, has stood the scrutiny of ages and in proportion as our moral feelings have been refined, its beauty has been more seen and felt. To suppose it invented is to suppose that its authors, outstripping their age, had attained to a unique delicacy and elevation of moral perception and feeling. But these attainments are not very reconcilable with the character of its authors, supposing it to be a fiction, that is, with the character of habitual liars and impious deceivers. But we are not only unable to discover powers adequate to this invention, there must have been motives for it. For people do not make great efforts without strong motives, and in the whole range of human motives, we challenge the unbeliever to suggest any which could have induced the work now to be explained. Once more, it must be remembered that this invention, if it were one, was received as real at a period so near to the time ascribed to Christ's career that the means of detecting it would have been unlimited. That people should send out such a forgery and that it should prevail and triumph are circumstances not easily reconcilable with the general tendencies of our nature. The character of Christ, then, was real. Its reality is the only explanation of the mighty revolution produced by his religion. And how can you account for it, except by that cause he always chalked it up to, a mission from the Father? 
Next to the character of Christ, his religion might be shown to abound in circumstances which contradict and repel the idea of a human origin. For example, its representations of the paternal character of God, its teaching of a universal love, the stress which it lays on inward purity, its substitution of a spiritual worship for the forms and ceremonies which everywhere had usurped the name and extinguished the life of religion, and its preference of humility and of the mild, unostentatious, passive virtues to the dazzling qualities which had monopolized people's admiration, its consistent and bright revelations of immortality, its adaptation to the needs of men and women as sinners, its adaptation to all the conditions, capacities, and sufferings of human nature, its pure, sublime, yet practicable morality, its high and generous motives, and its fitness to form a character which plainly prepares for a higher life than the present. These are the peculiarities of Christianity, which will strike us more and more in proportion as we understand distinctly the circumstances of the age and country in which this religion appeared, and for which no adequate human cause has been or can be assigned. Passing over these topics, each of which might be enlarged into a discourse, I will make just one remark on this religion about something which strikes my own mind very forcibly. Since its beginning, the human race has made great progress, and society has experienced great changes. And in this advanced condition of the world, Christianity, instead of losing its application and importance, is found to be more and more congenial and adapted to our nature and needs. We have outgrown the other institutions of that period when Christianity appeared, its philosophy, its modes of warfare, its policy, its public and private economy, but Christianity has never shrunk as intellect has opened, but has always kept in advance of our abilities and unfolded nobler views in proportion as they have ascended. The highest powers and affections which our nature has developed find more than adequate objects in this religion. Christianity is indeed uniquely adapted to the more improved stages of society, to the more delicate sensibilities of refined minds, and especially to that dissatisfaction with the present state, which always grows with the growth of our moral powers and affections. As we advance in civilization, we become susceptible of mental sufferings to which more crass ages are strangers, and these Christianity is fitted to comfort. Imagination and intellect become more restless, and Christianity brings them tranquility by the eternal and magnificent truths, the solemn and unbounded possibilities which it unfolds. This fitness of our religion to more advanced stages of society than that in which it was introduced, to needs of human nature not then developed, seems to me very striking. The religion bears the marks of having come from a being who perfectly understood the human mind and had power to provide for its progress. This feature of Christianity is of the nature of prophecy. It was an anticipation of future and distant ages, and when we consider among whom our religion sprung, where but in God can we find an explanation of this uniqueness? I have now offered a few hints on the character of Christ and on the qualities of his religion, and before leaving these topics, I would observe that they constitute strong evidence in favor of the miraculous events of the Christian history. These miracles were not done by a man whose character in other respects was ordinary. They were acts of a being whose mind was as unique as his works, who spoke and acted with more than human authority, whose moral qualities and sublime purposes were in accordance with superhuman powers. Christ's miracles are in unison with his whole character and bear a proportion to it, like that which we observe in the most harmonious productions of nature, and in this way they receive from it great confirmation. And the same presumption in their favor arises from his religion that a religion carrying in itself such marks of divinity and so inexplicable in terms of human nature should receive outward confirmations from omnipotence is not surprising. The extraordinary character of the religion fits together with and seems to demand extraordinary interventions on its behalf. 
Its miracles are not solitary, naked, unexplained, disconnected events, but are bound up with a system which is worthy of God and seemingly bears the marks of his hands, which occupies a large space and is operating with great and increasing energy in human affairs. As yet, I have not touched on what seem to many writers the strongest proofs of Christianity, I mean the direct evidences of its miracles, by which we mean the testimony borne to them, including the character, conduct, and condition of the witnesses. These I have not time to describe, nor is this labor needed, for William Paley's inestimable book, A View of the Evidences of Christianity, which is one of your classical books, has stated these arguments with great clearness and power. I would only observe that they may all be reduced to this one idea, namely that the Christian miracles were originally believed under such circumstances that this belief can only be explained by their actual occurrence. That Christianity was received at first on the ground of miracles, and that its first preachers and converts proved the depth and strength of their convictions of these facts by attesting them in sufferings and in death, we know from the most ancient records which relate to this religion, both Christian and heathen. And in fact, this conviction can alone explain their adherence to Christianity. Now, that this conviction could only have been caused by the reality of the miracles, we infer from the known circumstances of these writers, whose passions, interests, and strongest prejudices were originally hostile to the new religion, whose motives for examining with care the facts on which it rested were as urgent and solemn, and whose means and opportunities of ascertaining their truth were as ample and unfailing as can be conceived to conspire so that the supposition of their falsehood cannot be admitted without undermining our trust in human judgment and human testimony under the most favorable circumstances for discovering truth, that is, without implying that no one knows anything whatever. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Channing discusses the evidential significance of some qualities of Christian scripture. one type of Christian evidences to which I have barely referred, but it has struck with special force reflecting minds. I refer to the marks of truth and reality which are found in the Christian records, to the internal proofs which the books of the New Testament carry with them, of having been written by men who lived in the first age of Christianity, who believed and felt its truth, who bore a part in the labors and conflicts which went along with its establishment, and who wrote from personal knowledge and deep conviction. I will now add a few remarks to illustrate the nature and power of these internal proofs which we get from the books of the New Testament. The New Testament consists of histories and letters. The historical books, namely the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, are a continued narrative, embracing many years and professing to give the history of the rise and progress of the religion. Now, it is worthy of observation that these writings completely accomplish their goal, that they completely solve the problem how this unique religion grew up and established itself in the world, that they provide precise and adequate causes for this stupendous revolution in human affairs. It is also worthy of remark that they relate a series of facts which are not only connected with one another, but are intimately linked with the long series which has followed them, and agree accurately with subsequent history, so as to account for and sustain it. Now that a collection of fictitious narratives, coming from different hands, comprehending many years and spreading over many countries, 
should not only form a consistent whole when taken by themselves, but should also connect and interweave themselves with real history so naturally and intimately as to give no clue for detection, as to exclude the appearance of incongruity and discordance, and as to give an adequate explanation and the only explanation of acknowledged events of the most important revolution in society— This is a supposition from which an intelligent person at once revolts, and which, if admitted, would shake a principal foundation of history. I have before spoken of the unity and consistency of Christ's character as developed in the Gospels, and of the agreement of the different writers in giving us the unique features of his mind. Now, there are the same indications of truth running through the whole of these narratives. For example, the effects produced by Jesus on the various classes of society, the different feelings of admiration, attachment, and envy which he called forth, the various expressions of these feelings, the prejudices, mistakes, and gradual illumination of his disciples. These are all given to us with such clear indications of truth and reality as could not easily be counterfeited. The whole history is precisely such as might be expected from the actual appearance of such a person as Jesus Christ in such a state of society as then existed. The New Testament letters, if possible, abound in indications of truth and reality even more than the Gospels. They are imbued thoroughly with the spirit of the first age of Christianity. They bear all the marks of having come from men plunged into the conflicts which the new religion excited alive to its interests, identified with its fortunes. They revealed the very state of mind which must have been generated by the unique condition of the first propagators of the religion. They are letters written on real business, intended for immediate effects, designed to deal with prejudices and passions which such a religion must at first have awakened. They contain not a trace of the circumstances of a later age, or of the feelings, impressions, and modes of thinking by which later times were characterized, and from which later writers could not have easily escaped. The letters of Paul have a remarkable agreement with his history. They are precisely such as might be expected from a man of a vehement mind, who had been brought up in the schools of Jewish literature, who had been converted by a sudden overwhelming miracle, who had been entrusted with the preaching of the new religion to the Gentiles, and who was everywhere opposed by the prejudices and persecuting spirit of his own nation. They are full of obscurities growing out of these points of Paul's history and character, and out of the circumstances of the infant church, and which nothing but an intimate acquaintance with that early period can illustrate. This remarkable infusion of the spirit of the first age into the Christian records cannot easily be explained except by the fact that they were written in that age by the real and zealous propagators of Christianity, and that they are records of real convictions and actual events. There is another evidence of Christianity, still more internal than any on which I have yet dwelt, an evidence to be felt rather than described, but not less real because founded on feeling, I refer to that conviction of the divine origin of our religion, which springs up and continually gains strength in those who apply it habitually to their tempers and lives, and who drink in its spirits and hopes. In such people there is a consciousness of the adaptation of Christianity to their noblest abilities, a consciousness of its exalting and consoling influences, of its power to confer the true happiness of human nature, to give that peace which the world cannot give, which assures them that it is not of earthly origin, but a ray from the everlasting light, a stream from the fountain of heavenly wisdom and love. This is the evidence which sustains the faith of thousands who never read and cannot understand the learned books of Christian apologists, who perhaps lack words to explain the ground of their belief, but whose faith is diamond hard, who hold the gospel with a conviction more intimate and unwavering than mere argument ever produced. But I must tear myself away from a subject which gets larger continually as I proceed, Imperfect as this discussion is, the conclusion, I trust, is placed beyond doubt that Christianity is true, and my hearers, if true, it is the greatest of all truths, deserving and demanding our reverent attention and fervent gratitude. 
This religion must never be confused with our ordinary blessings. It is a revelation of pardon, which as sinners we all need. Still more, it is a revelation of human immortality, a doctrine which, however undervalued amidst the bright anticipations of inexperienced youth, is found to be our strength and consolation, and the only effectual spring of persevering and victorious virtue when the realities of life have scattered our visionary hopes. When pain, disappointment, and temptation press on us, when this world's enjoyments are found unable to quench that deep thirst for happiness which burns in every heart, when friends whom we love as our own souls die and our own graves open before us, to all who hear me, and especially to my young hearers, I would say, let the truth of this religion be the strongest conviction of your understandings. Let its motives and precepts sway with an absolute power your character and lives. This week's thinking music has been the track I Dunno by Grapes. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. Also, I have some other very exciting links there. For a more up-to-date and a far more sophisticated treatment of the topic of belief in miracles, be sure to check out the article by Christian philosopher Dr. Timothy McGrew called Miracles in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I have a link there for that. Also, if you want to learn more about the excellent early modern apologist who Channing mentions in his lecture, be sure to check out Dr. McGrew's website, historicalapologetics.org. Dr. McGrew knows something that I and a few other scholars know, which is that there is a treasure trove of well-argued apologetics material from the 17 and 1800s. Not everybody can read it easily, but for the more adventurous, the sources are just waiting for you to delve into them. Like the writings of Channing, these sources have been forgotten and they've gone out of fashion, but not for any good reason. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.